So that's how we started Pacific Trade International. As you can see, we really can't tell what we're going to do. So we come up with a very big name.、Uh, so we got different categories of product from our friends, and when we assembled them, we discovered that you know there is a candle there. It's a ball candle, about four inches, and it has beautiful patterns like stainless glass. And when you burn them, it really illuminates the pattern, and it's beautiful. We went to a trade show. We went to Charlotte, Carolina. We rented a very small, ten feet by ten feet booth. We put all our product out because we don't know which one is going to work. Five days later, we know exactly what we should focus on because we sold over fifty thousand dollar worth of product, and every single order has the candle、um, in their order. By the end of December for the first year, 1994, we were in business for five months. We made more than half million dollar sales. And now you have to watch our podcast. Hey everyone! Thanks for joining us for another episode of the Be Your Own Boss podcast. Our very special guest today is Mei Shi, and you probably have seen or have actually purchased some of her products. She founded Chesapeake Bay Candle, which she eventually sold fairly recently for seventy-five million dollars. And she's also the author of a brand new book that came out called Burn: How Grit. Innovation and a dash of luck ignited a multi-million-dollar success story. May, thank you for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. So, very first question for you:、uh, You talk about in the book.、Uh, there were quite a few chapters devoted to how you grew up, where you grew up, and I was reading that, and I saw a lot of parallels between your story and my family story because my family emigrated from the Republic of Georgia. Uh, under a communist regime many many years ago, and and have that immigrant mentality, and you talk about that in your book. So can you give us a little bit of background around where you grew up, how you grew up, and how you ended up in the United States? Absolutely.、Um, one of the chapters, actually, the first chapter of the book, actually is called、uh, "A Tale of Two Chinas," because literally I was growing up in. Very different world、uh, that is both called China. The first one was very closed,、uh, very homogeneous. Everybody would wear the same clothing and、um, sing the same songs.、Uh, there's not a lot of cultural differences, and there certainly wasn't a lot of uh,、um, sort of uh, uh, excitement from a, a cultural perspective. Uh, it's very、uh, isolated at that time, and、uh, everybody is very much,、um, you know, making the same amount of money,、um, enjoying the same food, which is not、um, a lot at that time. And then, when、uh, President Nixon visited China in 1974, it really ushered in a whole new China, a China that became a little bit more timidly opening its door, and it realized that.、Um, It needs to quickly industrialize, otherwise, its millions of population、uh, will be starving.、Um, so the two China、uh, coexisted in my childhood, and it, it left a very deep impression on me. And it's very interesting. My life experience paralyzes giant of a countries、uh, moving from、uh, one society to another. And、uh, to my eyes,、um, I still remember it vividly. Uh, the street、uh, where the kids hang out. There was no cars because literally there was other than buses, there would be trucks.、Uh, very few private. There was no private cars. Very few cars in general. These days, if you ever look at photos or you go to China, it's just as busy、uh, as any other modern city with、uh, rings and rings of highways and even、uh, super fast trains. So. Uh, looking back, I cannot believe that it all happened in my lifetime, and I was part of that、um, sort of transformation as well. So I grew up not knowing exactly what's going to happen to me, not knowing I would end up living in a whole different country on the other side of the ocean.、Um, but everything changed in 1979. After Chairman Mao died, China decided to 
open and to really uh, understand other culture better. And they quickly realized that they lack career diplomats, people that understand culture and foreign languages. And they realized the best way to catch up is to set up eight um, middle and high schools in uh, eight different cities around this country so that we would learn from a much younger age, which is 12 years old. So I was one of the first to enroll in uh, one of those so-called foreign language. And, you know, a lot of us will be prepared to go to diplomatic court. And I was 12 when I went to one of the schools in the city of Hangzhou, which uh, I don't know if you are familiar with China, is to the east of uh, Shanghai. And it's now very well known because of Alibaba is based there, uh, the giant of uh, the Chinese e-commerce platform. So when I was going into the foreign language middle school, it was such an interesting experience because even back then in 1979, it was a um, immersion program. So our teachers would be uh, teaching in English, uh, not just the English language, but also culture and history. And that experience really prepared me, I think, for everything that will become important later on in my life. Um, so I had a very exceptional childhood in that sense that I lived in such an um, important time. Mm -hmm. Made that painting that picture really takes us back and using the imagery, I can just imagine what it was like for you as a little kid with trucks and buses and, and just the image that you're painting for people like us who, well, Jacob's family came from Belize um, and had a very different uh, childhood than my parents. But I think for all of us watching and listening, it's hard to imagine. So thank you for painting that imagery. We're interested in the transition from living in China to coming over to, I believe, New York or the East Coast. Can you tell us what made you take that very scary leap to come over to America and, and why you came here? That's a very interesting question. Um, I was sent to work in a faraway um, city called Dalian. It's much colder, but um, I was also working at a warehouse a very empty warehouse where there was only one uh, supervisor and me. And every day I have two highlights. One thing is the truck comes in the morning to pick up a load and I cross on my clipboard check. And then another one come in the afternoon and I cross the checkboard. <laughs> That's the entire highlight of the day. Not only are we not speaking English or talking about world affairs, we're not even speaking Chinese because he was chain smoking the whole time. And after a month, I felt I'm going to go crazy. And I also know as a language student for 10 years, not practicing a language is going to be detrimental to, to that. And I decided against all objections of my family to quit. So in 1989, most people still work for government uh, affiliated uh, state owned companies or organizations. Quit at that time basically means I said goodbye to the diplomatic uh, career and I have to find jobs in the private sector. And there's really no uh, high level jobs. It's really tutoring, uh, teaching English to people with money, their children, or uh, tutoring people that are trying to learn English uh, as part of their job. So I went back to Beijing and started to get odd and ends jobs. I even worked as tourist, um, um, you know, translating for tourists to China. But I know that I would like to continue my education. So I applied and uh, I was fortunate to get into quite a bit of uh, different schools uh, because I want to focus on mass communication. I thought that when I was working at the World Bank, one of the difficulty was to see the local population uh, do not always agree with the goals and the objectives of what the banks want to invest. And I feel there's a lot more opportunity if they, they align their goals. Uh, the money will be, be more useful and be well uh, sort of utilized in each society. So I had this notion that I would go get a mass communication degree and then continually work for the World Bank here in, in Washington, D.C. So uh, that's what happened in January of 1991. 
I left China and I moved over to Maryland, and I have stayed since for thirty years now. Wow. Well, and how did you get from all of that into into candles, into in creating <laughs> Chester? You know, I, in the book, you shared uh, the story of the the impact and influence that Bloomingdale's had on, yeah. on this idea. So can you yes. share a little bit about the Bloomingdale's story and how you got involved in creating candles? Absolutely. And I remember, Jacob, you mentioned uh, your family come uh, immigrated from uh, Georgia, uh, the former Soviet Union. Um, and I can say that a lot of us, um, I always wonder if immigrants and entrepreneurs have, thing, have something very similar in common in that we both tend to be risk takers, that we abandoned sometimes what's familiar and what's comfortable and to pursue something that is entirely unpredictable. And it's that sense of um, risk taking that reward us at, as well as sometimes give us a different insight. So remember, I came here to pursue uh, journalism uh, and mass communication. And University of Maryland certainly is the right place to be. You know, it has one of the best programs in graduate degree. But I graduated in 1992 when the U.S. was in war with Iraq. And the World Bank is heavily funded by the United States government. When it went into war, it will usually withheld some of the dues. And as a result of that, again, when I graduate, um, they're not hiring at the World Bank. And I was advised by them to, you know, just hang out for a few years and then come back. So I did, but it was very difficult for immigrants to look for jobs, particularly in the non-technical areas, but more humanitarian or cultural areas. So imagine uh, working for a TV station or a PR agency, you need a green card or you even need a clearance. Um, so I was not able to take on any jobs like that. And I found a very um, low level job for a trade company focused on exporting very high tech equipment, such as CT scans and ultrasound machines to hospitals in China, because they at that time really realized that they're badly equipped. Uh, they need to catch up. So I was the export manager and my job uh, was slightly more advanced than obviously the warehouse job. I was actually working to facilitate communications with the GEs of the world, as well as um, helping the hospitals to um, visit the, the manufacturers such as GE Accuson Space Lab, which is a, a great company based in Mountain Hill, California that manufactures those uh, hospital beds uh, that can recline. And uh, it was slightly more interesting, but it was also more difficult in that I was isolated. I was uh, brand new to New York. My husband, who uh, was someone that I met in China, was married in China, at that time started to work in the U.S. in D.C. So I ended up commuting every week. On um, Fridays, I came back to D.C. During the uh, week, I was living alone in New York. And I really don't know anybody. So it was a very, uh, you know, difficult transition for me. Also because the hours are very long, the work hours are very long. So the only bright spot was that I was put in a hotel near the Bloomingdale flagship. And that for someone that never seen such an abundance of merchandise, such a great uh, store with beautiful merchandising. It's like a paradise. It's like a bird out of a cage. You know, I was so happy. I remember, you know, people hate to be sprayed those fragrances when you were going into the store. They always spray some fragrances. Everybody hate it, not me. I'll say, what is the new fragrance today? Uh, I always want to be sprayed. And I remember going up, you know, from the cosmetic floor to the second floor, and it's the designer's floor, and you see beautiful very uh, contemporary designs from Donna Karen, Kevin Klein. I've always liked that kind of aesthetic, uh, more uh, clean, more um, simple. And then as you walk up the floors, it gets more and more uh, dated. And then you end up in the home floor on the top. And it's just like entering grandma's home. 
you know, it has all these dainty flowers and very ornate scroll legs and gilded um, decorations everywhere. And I just, you know, this is another thing I mentioned that sometimes as an outsider, those differences seems to be screaming at you because it's so obvious. It's like why someone would live in this kind of um, home where they dress this way. Um, so I keep mentioning the differences I see in the two floors to my um, ex-husband, David. And every day we talk on the phone about this discrepancy. And one day he just said, you know, you are not happy with your job. You're not uh, doing fun things that you want to do. And I'm not exactly happy you're not here. Why don't we both quit? And we, we just start doing something with the business that you see the opportunity, which is in home. Um, I'm not going to take credit for being a, a risk taker at that time, but I certainly followed and I certainly think that um, he has a bolder agenda, um, but I was the one that sort of see the opportunity in front of me and narrow down what we are going to focus on. So that's how we started um, Pacific Trade International. As you can see, we really can't tell what we're going to do. So we come up with a very big name. And I moved back into Washington, D.C. in the summer of 1994. I started working in New York in 93. So. Mm -hmm. So May, I love your description of Bloomingdale's. I can remember being in New York and I think this summer of 2019 for a videotaping and I just felt like I didn't have the right clothes for this videotaping. <laughs> and so I walked into Bloomingdale's and I was in heaven. I got lost in there and I just felt like so glamorous and I walked <laughs> out with a bunch of right. clothes and new outfits for this for these videos I was going to film. But I, I can absolutely imagine in front of me how you feel when you get into Bloomingdale's because it's just this beautiful elevated experience. Right. And actually what I do when I'm not doing this with Jacob is I write about customer experience. And of course, Bloomingdale's, I mean, you just feel like you've been transported when you walk into exactly. a store like that. And that's the point. I think that's what really pulled you and you thought, oh, yes. there's something yes. here. Yes. Um, you know, growing up, we have stores, but they are always, everything is locked into inside a cabinet. If you want to see something, someone has to bring it to you. And they watch with very careful eyes if you open anything or try anything. There's no such a thing of testing something. And so... Even in the 1980s, when things started to open up, it's really necessities. It's not, uh, you know, the, the latest of any trend. It's only in the last 10, 20 years that China gradually caught up. And now they're in the middle of everything. You have five Louis Vuitton stores in one city. And it's not surprising because they have such a big population. So I was completely... Um, lost you know in that in that atmosphere and just uh, even i even if i couldn't afford anything just being part of that environment is so inspirational hmm. so i have to say that a candle to me is very experiential because you smell it it makes you feel a certain way it's beautiful it's relaxing it, it creates an ambiance it's got customer experience all over it so like it totally makes sense <laughs> But how did right. you take this idea, this inkling you and your husband had that, okay, this could be something into, we create this successful business, we sell it for a lot of money. Like, right. it sounds like you started with really nothing. So how, what was the process of growing it? Well, um, we actually didn't start making what you would describe a very experiential candle, which is the fragranced candle. We started with a more decorative candle. Remember, um, once I quit, um, we started this business, we really don't know what home uh, category product we would actually focus on. We know it's big. Uh, home industry include textile, you know, all the furnishing and all the decor items. So it's a huge uh, multi um, industry sort of category. So we just have one um, benefit. Remember, a lot of my friends were trained as diplomat. But at that time, obviously, you can't have uh, hundreds of diplomats. So a lot of them end up working for state-owned foreign trade companies, which is 
booming in the 1980s and 90s because of China's newly acquired status of the as a factory of the of the world. So when I reach out to them to give me ideas, I was giving back a lot of samples. I was giving back um, the fake trees. I don't know if you remember the plants that are silk flowers. So they are silk because they, you know, they don't need to be taken <laughs> care of. <laughs> oh, you have one. They look real to me. <laughs> but then there's also seat cushions, you know, pillows. Um, candle holders or holders of any kind, you know. Uh, so we got different categories of product from our friends. And when we assembled them, we discovered that, you know, there is a candle there. It's a ball candle, about four inches, and it has beautiful patterns like stainless glass. And when you burn them, it really illuminates the pattern and it's beautiful. I didn't know what you do with a candle because honestly, you can imagine I grow up with very few usage of candle other than when you're really out of uh, power and you just burn the taper. So I just carried it um, and then we decided to try our luck, which is, I feel, a very good thing we did. Instead of just directly visiting customers, we, go to, we went to a trade show. In September, there was no more big trade shows. All the big trade shows, uh, take place usually in July or August when big stores and small stores get ready for holiday. And after that, there were only small regional trade show. We went to Charlotte, Carolina. We rented a very small 10 feet by 10 feet booth. We put all our product out because we don't know which one's gonna work. We just light them around. The candles were small, so it was in the front of the table. And then we have some shelves that some of the larger things like the tree would be stand alone. And then five days later, we know exactly what we should focus on because we sold over $50,000 worth of product and every single order has the candle um, in their order. We were so amazed that this market, as small as it is, a very regional uh, market will give us that information and so are you we saying, were let so me happy. Stop you, May. So are you saying that you had more product than candles out and then you oh, realized? Oh, yes, yes. Okay. It's like real life AD We have testing. almost 10 <laughs> categories. <laughs> so I know for sure that silk flowers, it's, if you research, it's about a billion dollar or more business, right? If you, if you Google, oh, well, at that time, there was no Google, but you know the size of pillows and textiles for home. That's a huge category too. And then I think we have, decorative fans. So, you know, those paper fans and that's decorative accessories, another huge area. So we have five or six different categories. I would say that either any of those we could focus on, but after the trade show, it is very clear because the orders is focusing on so clearly one direction. It's the least space uh, driven uh, product too. So we immediately shipped to all these customers and they were able to sell out and they reordered many times. By the end of December for the first year in 1994, we were in business for five months. We made more than half million dollar sales. That's to tell you how hitting it right where it um, was at the beginning of the industry and knowing that we have to carry inventory to ship orders and we were able to bring in more containers that whole process just worked beautifully. And that's the beginning of our candles. But the next year in 1995, we were very confident. We decided to go to a big show in New York. There was the show of trade shows in Jacob Center. And we built, uh, built a nicer booth, still 10 by 10, but more focused. And this was a disaster. No one, not many people ordered. And they all say, well, this is a product for holiday. So that's when I woke up and realized that while we hit a jackpot with the glow candle, we may have missed something because people burn it. And when the friends are not around, they put it away. They think it's so pretty, they don't want to use it. Um, so yeah. I had a chance to look at the trade show and I realized that what I'm missing is the fragrance. And that is, the, that is what I decided to incorporate and also much brighter, uh, color palettes, much more interesting fragrances. When you mention fragrances, I, I researched and noticed that most of the candles in a very old fashioned jar, 
and they're very old fashioned colors like mulberries and hunter green and navy blue. There are a lot of vanillas and the, the photos are always um, the same. You know, if you look at the jars, you don't really know how many brands are there. And I just asked myself, can I make it more, you know, contemporary? Can I breathe some more fresh air into it? And I think it's have been uh, focusing on that business for 25 years. Wow. So. Can you talk a little bit about um, how you got, so you get the idea for candles and you kind of just real life A-B testing and you see that people are buying it. How do you go from that to scaling it to such a massive company that you sell for 75 million? Because obviously you need to <laughs> the candles, you got into these big box retailers. So how did you go right. from this tiny little company into something so big? I would say our growth has been very fortunate. Um, you know, that's another thing about entrepreneurship is the timing uh, sometimes is so critical. Um, we started right when the fragrance uh, candle business is starting to catch on. Uh, it started really in the 60s. Yankee Candle started in the 70s. But, you know, the industry is always a smaller scale, more mom and pop business. In the 90s, uh, some of the bigger stores like Bed Bath & Beyond, even Bloomingdale started to carry fragrance for the decor value and for the fragrance value. So when I see the gap of home and fashion, I was really up to something. How did I know? In February of 1995, after the uh, you know failure in the New York gift show, being international, I was always very ready to research. So I got myself into a much bigger international home show in Frankfurt, Germany. And this is something about someone grow up in a very multinational background. So I feel very comfortable to go to Europe and see what the trend is there. And it was such a great uh, trip for me because I see the emergency of a contemporary point of view. Europe always is a little bit more clean in their home decor, but when you combine the German aesthetics and the Northern European, the, the IKEA's sort of minimalist uh, aesthetics, then you really see the potential of going in that direction where colors are vibrant. Uh, they're, not, they're not afraid of using bold colors and they're not afraid of using prints that are cropped. You know, instead of uh, multiple small flower patterns, you have a big giant uh, flower and maybe it's just cropped. So to me, that's the way I see the future of home and I see it in my face, you know, right there. And it's so much cleaner, so much more contemporary and it matches that woman that's walking um, on the street with, um, you know, with the Ralph Ruans or the Kevin Kleins mostly, Kevin Kleins and Donna Carey's. So I came home already exposed to a much contemporary point of view that uses color, uses uh, texture to express different season, to express different um, attitude, design influence. And I was very good at um, being able to start, uh, if, you know, elaborating, but also experimenting. So I never know how to make candles, uh, particularly fragrance candles. So I found a supplier uh, called Peter French. He is an expert in color, but he also understands fragrance. So I went to New Jersey. I learned how to make things, but I improvised on that. I make colors that is more contemporary and bold. But what I think we made a, a great difference also is to, to combine fragrances. Fragrance candle used to be pretty single dimension. So way back 20 years ago, you would only find a mulberry candle, a vanilla candle, a watermelon candle. You wouldn't find something that's called copper moon, or you wouldn't call it something that's called uh, the temple. You know, what's the smell of a temple? What's the smell of a copper moon? It's more, it's more imaginative, but it also, um, it also gives you a creative license. So that's where the journey I traveled. It's, it's, uh, it's creating a lot more uh, thoughtfulness in design and using the manufacturing that we control to experiment something that uh, brands like Yankee Candle, um, you know, Carolina Candle, those are very big companies, didn't even think about. 
I, I think that's how we break into. Uh, we were immediately, by the way, uh, accepted into a Bloomingdale. I was very happy to go back in 1996 and see Bloomingdale displaying my candles and seeing how that upgraded um, the design. So that 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 is a good feeling. And being right at the right moment, uh, having a support from manufacturing and able to scale was all part of the reason that we were able to to grow pretty fast. So it must be interesting to launch a category, basically, which it sounds like it's something you did. Today, everyone has fragrant candles. I, I keep thinking of Joe Malone, and I'm thinking, should I tell her? Should I not? Should I say that or not? But, I mean, it's just everywhere. Everyone has these fragrant candles. So what did you do when competitors or copycats started to show up? How did you handle yeah. that? Well, I think while there's always, um, you know, the question of the, the biggest, uh, the, you know, the biggest confirmation of your success is when people copy you, uh, certainly it's one of the challenges. And don't forget, I work out of mm -hmm. Asia. So the, the intellectual, the, 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 the LP protection is, is terrible. So I always say I started the fragrance uh, manufacturing industry in Asia because when I started making candles, China does not have any fragrance industry. They have what it's called a flavor industry, right? So if you think about what you add into a cake or a soda, they would have that, but they don't have a fine fragrance background. That's so, so interesting. I I actually, a flavor, like, I mean, a scent you wear is not something you eat. When I think of flavor, I think it's something you eat. So it's like, if you think <laughs> about it as a concept, like it really is, like strange in a way. Yeah. Well, actually, the line has blurred more. But um, back in the 1990s, China export a lot of uh, raw materials. They export dry flowers uh, in jasmine, and they probably uh, export a lot of essence, such as um, you know the green tea essence or uh, the cinnamon essence. But they don't have a compounding chemical industry that mimic and combine with essential oils. So what happened is that I developed with fine fragrance houses here. Once we develop the fragrance samples, we send them back to China, put them in the candles. Once everything is uh, finalized, I show them to the customers, you know, big customers, obviously, because I haven't at that time, um, no, I, I have a huge amount of small stores, but they don't individually design their product or need their product. It's always the same brand. And then once they place order, I f a place order here and I ship by container those big trumps of oil into China to put them into the candle. So it's a very difficult process. So in the beginning, I don't have a lot of competition in the, in, in from that part of the world. My competition is mostly here. Um, but, you know, we are so creative. We're always ahead of the curve. When people are starting to copy some ideas like lavender, you know, combine lavender with vanilla, we're looking at how can we design a collection of drink. You know, I was inspired by uh, my martini in when we traveled to London one year. I remember a great one called Rose Lychee Martini at this a new mm -hmm. restaurant at that time called um, Buddha Khan. And it was very I've interesting. Because I, You've been there? Uh -huh. yeah, in, in Philadelphia, though. Yeah, there's a, there's a, a few of those uh, great restaurants. And I just like rose when it's fresher. I don't like rose when it smells very powdery because, again, it smells like your grandmother. But when uh, lychee, yeah. which is very sweet and juicy and tropical, married with rose, it really gives it a much younger and much more vibrant vibe. And I just started thinking, maybe I can do a drink-inspired collection, which we did. We launched at Target as a summer end cap with beautiful tropical flowers as labels and long shot glasses. <laughs> we put them into different martinis, you know, different, you know, we have one with lychee rose, and then we have one with mojito, with a lot of mint. I mean, that's the way I think. I don't get hung up on what 
people were copying me about because I'm already going after other things. So um, I always feel the creative type, you know, they don't have time sometimes to defend themselves because they're always looking at what's new, what's new. <laughs> and that, that, that kind of uh, process, um, you know, get them into places. And um, obviously they, their business team needs to help them. But um, we were way ahead of the Joe Malones of the world in the sense of creating a lifestyle in a bottle, creating an experience in a in a fragrance. And I was also very good at matching it with the giftable. So when I was making candles, not just jar candles, when we make a pillar candle, we also want to make, make it uh, work well with a holder. And we package them together so that you know how many times when you have a candle but you don't have a holder and you look around and then you even go to stores and you can't find it it's so annoying so i said why why do people have to be uh stressing over this gift they should just have everything in one place so yeah. that that sense of understanding what consumers uh, need to look for um helped us a lot can you talk about some of the challenges that you had to overcome uh, I know in your book you talk about the uh, the challenge of getting into Target and building that relationship, and then there was an issue where some of your products were potentially being held up at customs, and you had to take a loss yeah. on some things. So there were a lot of things that you had to overcome. So share some of those challenges. I think the biggest uh, challenge probably is the anti-dumping duty. Um, let me be honest with you. What we're watching in the last two or three years when the government are starting to have trade wars with different countries was never new, right? You know, there was always trade war with every country or with a lot of countries that this started to affect our domestic industry. So in the case of Chinese wax or Chinese candle product, it's not just they are lower prices. A lot of the candles coming from China uh, was so low that it, it becomes anti-dumping subject. Uh, that means what they are selling um, with the cost of those candles are much lower than the cost of um, making it in the US. So we started to have rate that is going to be around 108%. Uh, can you imagine? So imagine you have one candle at $1, you have to pay $1.08 to the government of the US, then you take it home and you distribute it. So it's suicidal. At that time, we started, um, it, it was such a you know negative impact on us. We just started to feel very confident with our supply chain because the customer's demand is so uh, critical that when you move manufacturing around, just like you hear when people are talking about manufacturing vaccine, right? Even huge companies, it's a problem, let alone a small candle manufacturer. But nevertheless, with that uh, kind of challenge, and you go to your retailer, like a Target, you say, I need to increase your retail. I don't think they can do that easily with you because they will say, why? Uh, I've been selling this candle for $10. How can you ask me to sell for $20? It's, our customer won't understand it. So. Those are times where I, I completely understand. I was always listening to the, the challenges for Pfizer, the challenges for Johnson & Johnson, for PPEs. And I know it's not going to be overcome overnight. What happened was um, I took the liberty of traveling around the world. Remember, I, I went to the trade shows when I don't know what to do. So it's the same thing. I went to Mexico to see if Mexico is a, it's a possible place for us to move to. And unfortunately, the place we land is Tijuana, uh, which is on the other side of San, San Diego. And I saw all the, all the, uh, you know, safety doors and all the iron gate, iron windows everywhere. And I know there was so much crime. And I said, you know, I can't do it. And then I went to Philippines and Thailand. While the environment is better, the pricing is already very high. It's just very prohibitive. And that's where I found and discovered Vietnam in the early 2000s. Vietnam just normalized relationship with the US and they're very friendly and the people speak some Chinese. So my factory in China can send its leadership and manufacturing uh, experts there. 
So that proved to be the very best decision that we could get. Um, if mm -hmm. you look at a lot of the industries that move out of China, the first place they move to is Vietnam. So I always say problems like this sometimes can be opportunities. We would never have looked outside of China if we did not have that very urgent issue. And it all allowed me to move into a much uh, safer country for that reason and a country that is just beginning to catch up. So um, at that moment, it wasn't fun. But when you look back two, three, four years later, it, it's definitely uh, what uh, those changes or those demands really produced a good result and a, a lot of learning for me. Hmm. May, it's clear to me that what you've done your whole life is you've taken challenging circumstances and turn them around. And I think our listeners and viewers can be inspired by you because so many, um, so many curveballs happened in the last year with COVID. Yes. Uh, stops and starts. It's been really challenging, I'm guessing, yes. for most of our audience because everybody had something that came up. And your story of even just finding a place to manufacture your product, Mexico didn't work, this didn't work, that didn't work, Philip <laughs> didn't work, and you just continually figure it out. What advice do you have for current or future entrepreneurs that might be struggling right now? And um, how, how can we learn from what you've done? You know, I have to remind you and the audience that I actually did graduate twice into very bad situation. Um, I don't think it ever happened again in China where the graduate year actually was sent away. And then also the war hasn't happened uh, in the US with other countries for, I mean, with other countries for a while. So I completely understand how devastating it is to graduate 2020 and not able to find any jobs. Either, um, you know, you don't find a job or you find a job that you really don't love. Uh, it's not where your passion is. But I actually think these are the moments, particularly now, are the moments where there are a lot of hidden opportunities. Why did I say that? Uh, just look at retail, right? Uh, we counted more than 75,000 retail store closing, including the Pier 1 chain, uh, a lot of JCPenney's, and a lot of Macy's. People are still shopping, and they're shopping online. Are there any other ways of retail that perhaps it's set up in a more local environment, more community driven, more open space? People even see that in a parking lot, if you do a pavilion kind of shopping, people love it because they don't need to, uh, you know, they don't need to go inside and they feel they're more free. So that's an, an opportunity, right? Um, I also see that. Um, one of my thesis at the, uh, writing the book is about a creative economy. I'm very passionate about engaging American again to have a conversation about creative manufacturing, for example. It's not just that we missed the production of the chips. We missed the production of the PPEs or manufacturing of the vaccines. That whole manufacturing mentality has gone. And with it, we could create opportunities. When I was offering jobs at my factory, I can tell you people that work there are very proud. They otherwise wouldn't make a very good living. They start working at 7.30. By 3.30, they're home. They can take care of their children. And then they can call their friend and say, do you have that collection yet? We just shipped to Target. What does it look like? Oh, you like it. I'm so happy I made it. Those feelings of making things, not just buying things as a country, is so yeah. important. You know, so I do feel um, now the government is starting to talk about, you know, prioritizing supply chain. It's not just prioritizing supply chain, it's changing the point of view for a whole generation and creating jobs, frankly, for some people that don't want to work with technology uh, in the computer. You know, they want to use their hand. What's wrong with that? Uh, everything can be made better, right? If a candle can be made better, the underwear can be made better, food can be uh, created better, houses can be built better, um, the road certainly can be better. So if you look at, if you have that kind of lenses, like I said, the immigrant lenses is that, you know, there's nothing you can change for the better. Yeah, I love that advice. And I, uh, we actually have a video that's going to be coming out in a few weeks where I talk about the importance of 
why having an immigrant mentality is actually um, an asset, something yeah. that's so beneficial. Because some people say, oh, you're an immigrant, you know, it's, maybe it's hard for you, but it's, I think it's a huge asset and a very valuable thing. Yeah. Uh, and you touched on many of the reasons why. Um, well, to wrap up, I think we want to do a couple rapid fire questions with you. Just some, just some fun questions. I'll let Blake lead those, but I want to start off with one that's usually not on our list. And that is what is your favorite, um, fragrance or candle that, uh, that you guys offered? Or well, product? it's so hard. Um, you know, my favorite fragrance is more of a ozonic fragrance. I like more like a men's cologne kind of, uh, oxygen uh very woodsy but also very watery um we have a great fragrance uh with a collection called mind and body it's called balance and harmony it has mm. a little bit pear and a little bit um ozone um it's one of the best uh fragrances that i feel we created um it is once you know very yeah. environmental too <laughs> So the next round of questions, just say the first thing that comes to mind, it's rapid fire and it's just time to have a little fun. So apparently we have our, a, our a dog guest. wants to say hi to you. I see. I see. Oh. Oh, wait, I have a dog too. <laughs> we need a dog scent candle. And that... No, we don't. Dogs don't use <laughs> it. Oddly enough, when she sleeps, she smells like chips. It's very weird. It's a good wow, smell, actually. That's I would interesting. Yeah. 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 It has to do with dog sweat, actually, which... Right. <laughs> anyway, okay, rapid fire. Let's have some fun. Let's stay focused. Okay. So first question, if you could, if you only could have one food and one drink on an island, which food and drink would they be? I remember someone asking, it was a sun and, and food. I would have sushi. I would never get tired of eating it. And did you say uh, a drink? Yes. A glass of uh, white wine. I thought you were going to say a rose lychee <laughs> cocktail. <laughs> well, how is it's, 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 like? it's a bit demanding. <laughs> yeah. And so I can't drink too much of the alcohol. Yeah, but, okay. but wine, I can drink a little bit more. What's your most embarrassing work moment? Uh, I'm known for mayism, which is uh, being an English speaker but not native. Sometimes I make stuff up. I would say catch 23 all the time. <laughs> so oh. Someone was born with a silver platter. <laughs> <laughs> so people, people start writing down how much, uh, they love my mayism, which is all these, yeah, uh, Jacob's, catch 23s I, I, and I know exactly, I know exactly what Blake is going to say now. Go ahead. Yeah. Dear. We love Jacob's dad. He, he has a whole vocabulary that we just love him so much because he has invented <laughs> he, he did things that are just a little bit wrong where you're like, wait a minute. I think I know what you mean. Can but, you give us an example? Um, where he will say like, I'm not, um, photo, no, he wouldn't oh, say photogenetic. Oh, photogenetic. Oh yeah. He would say, <laughs> I'd say, yeah, look at the you. Say, no, no, I don't want to be in the picture. I'm not photogenetic. And I'm like, wait a minute. I think I know what you mean there, but that's not quite right. Oh, he's funny. actually brilliant. Well, he's like an aerospace. Yeah. A uh, scientist, but yeah, he's also photogenetic. Well, sometimes it's a brilliant people also invent these things because we're a little bit absent-minded. You know, we, we think we got it, but <laughs> in the end we didn't. Only now yeah. I started to say catch 22. <laughs> I okay. completely. Well, it <laughs> <Really? laughs> yeah, probably is. Um, what's your greatest joy? You know, I didn't realize that, but I do love uh, cooking these days. Um, I, uh, I miss the creative aspect, uh, mixing fragrances, mixing colors, just mixing things. So now I really enjoy cooking. When I cook, I have a glass of wine. I usually have the music on or I have TV on. And it was the was most uh, enjoyable moment. <laughs> yeah, I like a party. If you, and I like people, if you, yeah, to enjoy the food. You don't have to explain that to us. We are big foodies. If you could have lunch with anyone dead or alive, who would it be? Excuse me, what is the question? If you could have lunch with anyone dead or alive, who would it be? Oh, if I can have anyone's life? Hmm. No, if you could have lunch with anyone. Oh, if I can have lunch. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Um, if I can have lunch. Wow, that's such a interesting question. Elon Musk. 
Okay. Well, that's it for our episode today. Elon, if you're listening, you have a wonderful <laughs> lunch date waiting for you in Maryland. With I, I would like to that lunch date too, if possible. I think he's um, a design genius because I, I loved my Tesla so much. I believe what he has done is amazing. So I can't imagine, you know, not having fun talking to him. <laughs> yeah, he's so, fascinating for sure. It'd be pretty interesting. Um, yeah. Well, thank you so much, May, for taking time out of your day to speak with us. We really, really appreciate it. Well, let's let's keep in touch. I want to know more about uh, how you started your your business and this uh, podcast. It sounds fabulous. Uh, well, <laughs> such a fun way. You're going to have to start people. a podcast, and then we'll be a guest on your show. Yeah. Well, please don't start talking to me about podcasts. <laughs> uh, it's so it's so alluring because I like to listen to I like to turn around. I like to interview people. I, and I'm very curious how people start doing things, too. So, yeah, good luck very with cool. your um, with your podcast. And um, I'm um, I'm very thankful that you asked such great questions. And it's fun talking to you. Yeah. both. Thank you very much. I and enjoyed it. It's not every day I interview with a couple, so you two look oh, very yeah. cute together. <laughs> we hope that's what makes us unique. I, we just <laughs> okay. Very cute um, together. So, thank you and thank you. He has everyone. a nice natural scent, a little musty. The ocean, all the things you described. That's the only well, reason I'm here see, for this, the scent. You know, speaking of scent, you two would appreciate weird. this. It's the, it's the it's the reason why we miss people. It's because of this scent that we, yeah. like when my husband travels, I couldn't sleep very well. And I realized it's because of the, of this, that you are familiar with someone and that what, that absence is uh, what happens. So a lot of research yeah. is going on with that, uh, particularly after COVID, people realize they lost sense, they lost that, lost that connection. <laughs> <laughs> So that's why now they ask you the question, right? Have you recently lost your sense of smell? Oh, yeah, with COVID. Yeah. 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 Well, thank Very you good. again. Thank May you for again for us. allowing me to share with your audience. Of course. We had a great time. And thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Our guest, again, has been Mei Shi. Yeah, you probably have one of her products sitting in your house right now. But make sure to also <laughs> add another product, which is her book, <laughs> that just came out and it is called burn how grit innovation and a dash of luck ignited a multi-million dollar success story and you can learn a lot more about uh, what she did and how she did it in that book thanks for watching and listening and we will see all of you next time